God acts by instruments, and that's the basic idea, that God acts by instruments in this world today. So let's back up for just a moment and think about this attribute of God. And I'm thinking about the fact that God is omnipotent. When I say that God is omnipotent, I mean that God is all-powerful. We know that in Him we live, we move, and have our ever been. Acts chapter 17, 28. We know that He upholds all things by the word of His power. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. That's remarkable to think about when you stand in the winter night and watch the stars go by and think that all of these things are in perfect order, upheld by the almighty word of God. That's just absolutely remarkable to even think about if we can even contemplate it. Or we have Ecclesiastes 9 and 1, which states that all of our lives and all of our activities are in His hands. So God is omnipotent. However, there is a limitation to the omnipotence of God. And so what do I mean by that, that there's a limitation to His omnipotence? It is limitation not because of lack of power, not because of lack of ability, but by logical necessity by the logic of the case, because of the nature of God Himself and the nature of the world that He has created, there is a limitation pertaining to the omnipotence of God. For example, God cannot make a round square. That would simply be, of course, a violation of the very definition. That's, that's not a matter of, matter of power. It's simply a matter of the divine nature or the nature of the world that He has created. That's exactly what we mean when I say, for example, that God cannot change mathematical equations. Why is that? That's because He has created a world of natural law, and this natural law that flows out of Him absolutely orders the universe and gives it its order. It's the same thing regarding moral things or moral decisions. God cannot make wrong things right. Because morality flows out of God's character. And what is wrong is wrong because of God's character. It doesn't become right because people make a law saying it's right. It's wrong anyway in the eternal order of things. And that, of course, is what I mean when, it says, when I say that there's a limitation to the omnipotence of God. There's some things that God cannot do. And so we are told in the passage, Titus 1 and 2, that God cannot lie. It's not that He wants to lie and just can't seem to lie, the idea is that it is a violation of His nature. It flows out of His nature. Truth comes out of God. And He cannot lie that it would be a violation of His nature. So there are some things that God cannot do. So as we think about that, the limitation on the omnipotence of God, I want you to think about this particular chart. And I'm going to use this. I, I put this together simply in thinking about this lesson pertaining to the principle of instrumentality, and I'm going to utilize it in later lessons when it comes to the miraculous, as you will see. So here is the chart. It's a very simple chart. There are two columns on it. And it is titled, How Does God Act? And there are only two methods. There's the limitation. There are only two methods by which God acts. There can only be by the logical nature of the case because of His divine nature and the nature of the world in which we live. And so how does God act? Two columns, one of them on the left has beginning direct. It can be only directly or by direct action. Or what's the only other op option you have? Indirect. Is there an in-between position between direct and indirect? No. No, there's nothing in between. That's a logical necessity. Just the same as square is a square and a circle is a circle. That's a logical necessity. So exactly when we come to the word miraculous, We'll talk about that more in future lessons. But miraculous, the opposite of it, and the only, the only opposite of it is non-miraculous. Is there an in-between between miraculous and non-miraculous? No. Something is either a miracle or it is not, and that's the end of the case. So exactly when we come to the word supernatural, which is on the left-hand side of the chart, something is a supernatural act of God, that is suspension of the laws of nature, or it is by means of the law of nature, by the instrument of the law of nature. That's God acting. 
Or the last one on the chart is immediate, that is God acting immediately. That's not talking about immediately, that's quickly, but it's referring to without an instrument, without a medium. Or he acts immediately. Is there an in-between? Immediate and immediate? No, there's not. Those are the only logical possibilities that exist. And God acts in only these two ways, period. And at the bottom of the chart, I have the law of excluded middle. That's simply a logical framework to think about that something has a certain property or it does not have it, period. Everything in the world is either black or it is not black. And there are no alternatives than those two. Everything is colored either black or not black. Now, here's another one that might have more pertinence to what we're thinking about in religion. Everything or every, every living creature is either human or it is not. And we need to keep this in mind when we have discussions with atheists and evolutionists. Everything ha that has ever lived is either human or it is not. At what point did a non-human become a human? Well, no one can tell you that. No scientist who believes in evolution can believe, tell you when a human and what, and what properties were inserted into the non-human to make it human. No, everything is either human or it is not. And that's the end of the case. That's the end of the matter. And that's exactly what we mean when we say God acts either directly or he acts indirectly. And the law of excluded middle says there's nothing in between. Now, if someone says that there's something in between here, I'm happy to hear you on it after services, but I, as far as I know, this, these exhaust the logical possibilities. Now, one of the main points that we want to, to think about is this. What a huge, huge mistake for people to make today to suppose that because God acts through the agency of natural order or through the agency of the Word of God, that God therefore is not doing anything. That would be a mistake of magnanimous proportions. It doesn't equal that God's not doing anything, is it? Because God acts through natural law. No, God acts through natural law. And one of the passages that was read in your hearing was the one just a moment ago regarding Joseph. And Joseph is the one who makes the statement that was read by Brother Jim. Speaking to his brothers, you meant it for evil, they sold him to Egypt. But God meant it for good. God sent me here to preserve life. How did God do it? Did he do it miraculously? No. No, it was through natural means. It was through the free moral choices of the individuals involved. But God did it. So it is a huge, huge mistake to suppose that because God acts indirectly, non-miraculously, through natural means, or immediately through the Word of God, that therefore he's not doing anything at all. Let's take another illustration. God created Adam of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. God did it. But when we have the birth of Cain, Mother Eve made this statement, God gave me a son. Well, she actually, of course, was simply observing the law of procreation. It did not come about. Cain did not come about in the same sense that Adam did. But God did them both. So the main point that we want to glean this morning is let us not suppose and make a mistake to think that because God acts immediately, that is through the means of the Word of God or through the means of natural law, that therefore God's not actually acting. That would be a mistake, as I said, of magnanimous proportions. And so that's what I want us to think about this morning. So what I want to do is when we, when we look at the left side of the chart just for a few moments, because the balance of the time will be spent on the right side of the chart, that is. And I, we're going to have, and I hope your Bible's open, we'll look at passages that speak specifically to this particular point. But for right now, let's just think about, just to differentiate the entire issue here, let's think about, because we need to introduce this as we move along in our study, what is a miracle? What is a miracle? If people would consider the proper definition of what really is a miracle, then the question would be settled that there are no miracles occurring today. Only if we would think about it clearly. All we're trying to do is clarify our thoughts here. Now in the New Testament, the word miracle is not defined, not the essence of it. 
We are told that a miracle produces wonder and awe and is great power, but that doesn't give us what is the essence of a miracle. Now, I can multiply this definition or something very similar many, many times over, but just notice a couple of them, and you'll see words. By the way, these words, I, I, didn't, I didn't make the chart based upon what I see here, but you'll see that this is the only way people can think clearly about the issue. So the first one is from Vine's Expository Dictionary. I hope, I hope you have Vine's Expository. It's a great tool for Bible study. If you don't have it, then you're not really, uh, you're not really on the edge of certain word studies and really getting into some things because Vine's Expository Dictionary is a companion study to Bibles, uh, to your Bible. It's done in English. It's set up in English. It's a great, great tool. Here's how Vine's Expository Dictionary gives us the definition of a miracle. Now, I want you to listen to the words. Power, inherent ability, used of, a wor of works of supernatural origin and character such as could not be produced by natural means and agents. Pretty simple, isn't it? Not through natural means. It's the suspension of natural law. Once again, if we think about the definition of a miracle, really the issue settles itself, doesn't it? I hear people all the time say, well, uh, this is a miracle, that's a miracle, this is a miracle. Well, miracles happen everywhere all the time. Well, this is no longer a miracle because that would be just happen chance every single day. But what we're not doing is not thinking about with clarity, what is a miracle? It's a suspension of natural law. Or this is from C.S. Lewis in his book called Miracles. He's a great writer. A miracle is an interference with natural or nature by supernatural power. Notice again, we have natural and supernatural. That's all we have. And it's an interference or a suspension of natural law. Now that's a miracle. For example, think about the quality or the characteristic of miracles in the Bible. They're all demonstrable facts. What do I mean by that? That means that no one had a debate in the New Testament as to whether or not he or she could work a miracle. Paul did not stand up and debate that he could work a miracle. He had many debates. All through the book of Acts, he went in the synagogues and debated. But they never debated whether they could work a miracle. Why? They just did them. They were demonstrable. No one had to argue that it was a miracle. Now, isn't that interesting? We think about the debates that occur today. People say, I can work a miracle. This is a miracle. See, we're already off in another realm. They didn't have to debate that. As a matter of fact, even enemies confessed that these were miracles. Remember in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the Sadducees would say that a great and notable miracle has been done. We cannot deny it. Well, here are the enemies saying, we can't deny a miracle has been done. The same group of Jews in Matthew chapter 12, this time the Pharisees said in Matthew 12, well, the, a miracle has been done, but you got the power from Beelzebub, the prince of demons. They didn't deny a miracle had been performed. That's the characteristic of a miracle, of the New Testament. Or they were, here's another thing, they're instantaneous. They happen immediately. It was not something that we prayed for someone, and then two weeks later in the hospital, they recuperated. No, it was instantaneous. And furthermore, they all appealed to the sense of perception. Walking on water. Water that had become wine could be tasted. Going through the Red Sea, it could be experienced. Resurrection of Lazarus from the grave. They could see it. Unwrap his body, Jesus said. All of these things appealed to the sense of perception. It was not, well, I think that someone was healed and we're going to call it a miracle. Or over a period of convalescence, over a year, we're calling that miraculous. No, if we think about how miracles are really conveyed in the New Testament, it really settles the issue, doesn't it? That these are not being done today. But that's a preview of what we have coming later, and we'll need this information when we look at passages next week and the week following pertaining to the Holy Spirit as we look in the book of or the Old Testament, and then we move to the book of Acts. But now I would like to do this. Back to the chart. Let's, we're thinking about the right side of the chart. God acts indirectly, non-miraculously, through natural means and through medium, whether it be through nature or through the Word of God, it's still God acting. So let's look at some of these indirect activities. And I have a chart here. We'll not look at every single one of them. But I want you to get the sense of what we're talking about 
when we look at the indirect activity of God. So I hope your Bible's open, and you'll see these as you look. And first of all, we'll start with the book of Exodus. The first passage is Exodus 7 and 13. And this is God hardening Pharaoh's heart, or Pharaoh's heart being hardened, hardens hearts. And that's how I have it on the chart. Thirteen times in the book of Exodus, we are told that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. In chapter 7, we have two occasions in which we're told, one of them is verse 13, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. That is, Moses came with the word of God and told him, here's God's demand, Mo and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Then when we move to chapter 8, you'll see the phraseology this way. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart, his own heart. He was told the demands of God, he hardened his heart. But now when we move to chapter 9, the statement is made upon several occasions, God hardened his heart. So what does all of this mean? What does all of this conclude? His heart was hardened by the message that was preached. It doesn't demand, nor does it require, direct activity of God to harden the man's heart. As a matter of fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 6, Samuel, many years later, would reflect upon all of this and say the following. He says, I want you, Israel, not to harden your hearts as did Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Stop hardening your hearts. Who was responsible for the hardening of hearts? Ultimately, they were, we are, Pharaoh was. But it could be said that God hardened the heart by means, by the agency of his demands. And it works exactly the same way today. God's word impacts the heart. Some hearts it hardens and some it softens. That's God hardening hearts or softening hearts. Here's another one. Let's go to Romans chapter 11. I like this one because it gives us some of the same terminology but nevertheless, it changes it up just a little bit. We'll be at Romans 11 and verse 8. Let's think about the context. The context is, what about Israel? Paul has preached in Romans the gospel of salvation by means of faith of Jesus Christ. And he tells us that gospel is the power, Romans 1.16. And it is open to all who are believers. That is, obedient believers. However... The question comes about, as he opens chapter 9, what about Israel? Where does Israel fit into God's plan? And in part of that answer, here is how Paul says it. And this begins in chapter 11, and we'll start at verse 8. Or verse 7, rather. We'll start at verse 7. What then? That which Israel seeks for, that he obtain not. That what is? That is the blessings of God. But the election obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Even as, as it is written, now he's quoting from Isaiah 28 or 29 in verse 10. God gave them a spirit of stupor. Eyes they should not see, and ears they should not hear, until this very day. And David said, now he's going to quote from the Psalms. David said, let their table be made a snare. That is their blessings. The blessings to Israel became their snare. That have a lesson for us today in America? Indeed it does. Let their table be made a snare, a trap, and a stumbling block. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see. Bow down their back always. So, Israel was hardened. But what is the agency by which they were hardened? It was the preaching of the gospel. How do we know that? That's how Paul managed his affairs, isn't it? In the entire book of Acts, he went and preached into the synagogues and begged them to obey the gospel of Christ. But they did not. Most of them refused the gospel, and God gave them a spirit of stupor. But right here in this context, just go down to verse, verse 11 for a moment. I say then, did they stumble, that's Israel, that they might fall? That is, is that the end of the story? And he says, God forbid. But by their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, I want you to go down to verse 23 for just a moment. Paul gives an illustration. And the illustration is branches that have been cut off of a tree, the olive tree. And the olive tree has branches, Gentile and Jew. And he says this, the Jews have been cut off. 
because of their unbelief. But he says in verse 23, they may be grafted in again if they what? If they become believers. You see that in verse 23? If they believe, they can be grafted in again. So obviously it is not God by miraculous action. By direct action, putting the spirit of stupor on them, it is by means of his preached truth that their hearts became hard. And that is the case throughout the New Testament. So let's look at this one, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. Let's go back to the old. See, we were just practicing back and forth, new, the old, old, new. Exodus 20, you recognize, is the Ten Commandments. And here we have one of the interesting statements that is made pertaining to idolatry. And specifically the sins, or more generally I should say, the, the sins of men in worshiping idols. So God says, I don't bow down to other idols and serve them. For I, Jehovah, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the fourth, third and fourth generation. What does that mean? That God says, if you bow down to idols, I'm going to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. That means that the choices of the fathers, the choices of those who have gone before us, affect us also. Whether it be in poverty, whether it be in lack of opportunity in life, whether it be in the sins that our fathers have participated in, it affects the succeeding generations, doesn't it? And we see that all around the world. People are suffering because frequently of the sins of the fathers that have affected the generations that follow. That's exactly what God says is going to happen. When you choose a path of idolatry in America... I'm going to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation of people. That is to say, there will be repercussions in America, and that's the natural order of things. That's how it's going to go. Now, that's a powerful thought, isn't it? There are some people in poverty today. But a lot of it, or much of it, at least in America, is because of choices that their forebears have made. And that's simply the natural order of things. But God says, and here's the point, I'm going to visit them with this. Well, it's through natural means. That's how. It's through an instrument, and that is the world that he created in the natural order of things. All right, let's look at this one. Jeremiah 6 and verse 16. I started to change slides there, and I thought, oh, whoop, stay right there. In Jeremiah 6, Jeremiah is preaching to the people, and he says, I want you to seek for the old paths wherein is the right or the good way. But the people said, we will not walk therein. You see that in verse 16? But I want you to watch what God says in verse 19 through the mouth of Jeremiah. He said, I'm going to bring upon them, because they refuse to walk in the good way, I'm going to bring upon them the fruit of their own decisions or the fruit of their own doings. What is that to say? It's to say that decisions we make today have fruit or has repercussions tomorrow. But in some senses, or in one sense at least, those repercussions are brought about because God visits the sins of forebears upon the children that come along. And that's the fruit of their doings. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows unto the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows unto the Spirit shall unto the, of the Spirit reap eternal life. That's the natural order. David was a great man of God, a man after God's own heart. But he made some decisions that affected him the rest of his life. And that was God visiting his own sins upon his children. That's the natural order of things. So let us not make the mistake to suppose, because that's the natural order God set up, that God's not doing anything. Here he speaks in the active voice, I am doing the visiting upon the people. We make bad decisions, and those repercussions come. Let's look at this one. I like this one particularly in John chapter 12, verse 37. And that is, God blinds the eyes of people. Let's watch what happens here. This is John 12 and verse 37. 
And I want you to be able to see it. So if you would turn in your Bibles to John 12. See, this is more of a practicum this morning. Because I want you to see it, not just hear me say it. This is so important as far as the lesson is concerned. So in 12 and 37, now this is basically a summary statement of all of Jesus' ministry according to John. When you get to John 13, next chapter, we're winding down. This is, the, this is of course, the night of his betrayal. This is the Last Supper, John 13. So this is a summary of all of his public ministry that has gone before. And I want you to hear what John, by inspiration, how he summarizes what Jesus had to do. But though he had done so many signs before them, yet they believed not on him. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled which spake, Lord, who has believed our message, to whom has the arm of Jehovah been revealed? That is to say, there's going to be general unbelief, and that was prophesied by Isaiah. And now that's 53 and 1 of Isaiah. Now he's going to quote from Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. And here's the passage I want you to think about. And as Isaiah has said before, for this cause they could not believe. Isaiah has said again, He has blinded their eyes. He has hardened their heart. Lest happily they should see with their eyes, understand with their heart, and should turn again, and I should heal them. I ask you the question, who is blinding whom here? He blinded their eyes. God blinded the eyes of the Jews. At the same time, we have passages such as John 7 and 17, where Jesus said, If any man wills to do my will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or I speak for myself. We have to have the proper will in place. And that's why our Lord preached to the Jews. But let's think about that passage and keep your finger there. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 13. Here is a passage that is parallel in its import to John 12 and 37. Matthew 13 and the verses 14. Matthew 13 and verse 14. I don't have it on the screen. But this is after our Lord began speaking in parables in Matthew chapter 13. And we're given the explanation of why he began to speak in parables in this particular text. And it begins this way, beginning chapter 13 and verse 14. Unto them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. This is why our Lord began to preach in parables. Unto them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing they shall hear, and shall no wise understand. Seeing they shall see, and shall no wise perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest happily they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, perceive with the heart, and should turn again, and I should heal them. Now, did you hear how our Lord himself quotes the passage from Isaiah 6, the same one that John quoted in John 12? Who did he blame here? He doesn't say God closed their eyes. He says they closed their eyes. Both of the passages are right. How did God do it? By presenting the gospel through the mouth of Jesus and the apostles and the miracles they performed, and they resisted, and therefore it was God blinding the people. He blinded their eyes, but by means, by agency. Isn't that interesting? So one passage, Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10, quoted in two places, quoted differently to give us the point. Let's think about this one. How about this one in Luke chapter 24? I'll give you a moment to go to Luke 24. And we'll start to read at verse 24 and verse 25. Luke 24. This is post, a post-resurrection appearance of our Lord. And this post-resurrection appearance, he's speaking to, you remember who it was? The two men on the road to Emmaus. And they didn't know who he was. And so they began to tell him what had transpired in Jerusalem. And they were just dumbfounded about it. And so here is how our Lord addresses them. Watch the reading in Luke chapter 24. I believe it's verse 24. O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, behooved it not the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning from Moses and from all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
Wouldn't that have been a great lesson to be a part of? Listening to our Lord interpret. Well, we have it right here in the New Testament. That's where we have it. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now we're told in verse 32 that after our Lord departed, they said to one another, our hearts burned within us. Because we thought we recognized him, in other words, but our heart was burning within us about his identity. But now I want you to go to get the point. Let's go down to verse 44. Verse 44. And at the end of Luke chapter 24, when you come to verse 44, he's speaking now to his apostles and the apostles only. These are my words that I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must needs be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their mind that they might understand the scriptures. And he said, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name unto all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. The language here is he opened their mind that they might understand the scriptures. Now someone just coming to it reading casually or cursorily might think, well, that means by a direct miraculous operation, he just put the scales off of their eyes. Not so. We are told how he did it in the earlier verses. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And here it simply says he opened their mind. How, how is that different? He simply interpreted to them. And when we allow that to take place with the apostles interpreting to us, God is opening our minds and he's opening our hearts. Isn't that beautiful? And it's, now we're ready for this passage, Acts 16, verse 14. Because this is one of the passages that so many people have so many questions regarding when it comes to this issue. And this involves Lydia. In Acts 16, a woman of Thyatira that was in Asia, traveled all the way to Europe, seller of purple. And Paul was in Asia himself preaching. God told him, shut down that gospel meeting. Go a thousand miles and travel over there to Europe. First time that the gospel would be preached on European soil. He landed at Neapolis, went to Philippi. Then he was told that there was a pray, place of prayer outside the city where some of the Jews were gathered to pray. Our place of prayer would be, of course, to worship. And there he met Lydia. Now we read that Lydia heard us. Remember Luke's doing the writing. Lydia heard us whose heart the Lord opened to give heed to the things that were spoken by Paul. The issue is, how did he open her heart? By the preached message. The same way that he opened the hearts of, on the men on the road to Emmaus. The same way he opened the hearts of the apostles. He opened her heart by means of the word. So the point is, very quickly and rapidly, and that is, let us not assume, because it says God opens hearts or God closes hearts or God hardens hearts, that therefore it has to be direct miraculous activity. We've seen already that does not necessarily have to be the case. Let's look at a couple of others here. I'm going to skip some of these, of course, because I have so much to think about. But let's look at, uh, let's go down here to the veil on the hearts, which is 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians 3 and 12. In this passage, Paul is using what is called, uh, doing what is called, or make, it's kind of a Jewish exercise called midrash, midrashim, which means that he is what we would think of as a parable, a parabolic style. Well, what does that mean? Well, Paul takes the, the illustration from the Old Testament. He's talking about the new law versus the old law. And he goes back to the Old Testament law and speaks about when Moses was on the mountain, received the law from God. All right, so remember what happened there. In Exodus chapter 34, God, uh, Moses went up on the mountain to meet God. When Moses came down, his face glowed, remember, because he had been in the presence of God. And so what did he do? Put a veil, put a veil on his face. Because it frightened the people. Now Paul says, there is a lesson in that. I want you to watch what it is. Now here's how Paul does it. This is 3 and 12. Having therefore such a hope that is regarding the new covenant. We use great boldness of speech. And are not as Moses who put a veil upon his face. So that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly upon the end of that which was passing away. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains. What's happening here? He says they have a veil on their heart when the old covenant is read. 
Then he tells us, Whensoever it shall turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. What's happening here? What's happening is when the gospel is preached, the same veil remains on their heart. In a sense, as was on Moses' face. And they were not understanding about it. Was that their fault? Absolutely was their fault. That's why Paul went and preached. To open their minds and open their hearts, according to Acts 26 and verse 16. He was told to do that very thing. Open their minds. How would Paul do it? Preached message, that's how. And that's what was happening with the Jews. Let's think about this one. Let's go to the top of the right-hand side, where we have in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26, God is going to give the people in the new covenant, he says, a new heart and a new spirit. I have a, I have a friend, an acquaintance, who's written a book, and he, he likes to stay on this passage, Ezekiel 11 and 9, says, God giving us a new spirit, it has to refer to direct miraculous action. Not necessarily. Let's look at this for just a moment. He says, I will give them a new spirit. Speaking about the new covenant period. I will give them a new spirit. We're in Ezekiel 36 now, verse 26. I will give them a new spirit. I'll put my laws in their minds. Now, how is that to be done? How are we to give a new spirit or get a new spirit? Well, according to Ezekiel chapter 18, God commands the people that they get themselves a new spirit. How can that be? Well, if it's done by miraculous action of God, there's no way you're going to do it. It's done by means of adherence to what God has to say, and he puts a new spirit in us. Even though it is spoken of as direct activity, it is by means and by agency of the message, the word of God. Here's an interesting one in 1 Samuel chapter 11, number 7, moving down the chart. Samuel said this, or it is said in the book of Samuel, written by Samuel, and I just was going through this in, one, in Bible study one day, and it's kind of an interesting statement. But it says that the fear of the Lord fell upon the people. And what does that mean exactly, the fear of the Lord fell upon the people? Alfred Edersheim makes a comment that is so good. Alfred Edersheim is a, a Jewish man who is, who is a Jewish rabbi. He was converted to Christ about 150 years ago, and he writes these fabulous commentaries on the record. And, and shows us exactly what a lot of the Jewish people miss. So in this, he points out the following. He says, God put this on them. That is, fear of the Lord fell upon the people. But the text, now listen carefully, the text always traces up the cause to the eternal first cause, not by miraculous activity, but because God is the ultimate first cause. That is exactly right. That's exactly the point. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the people, not because he does it miraculously, directly, but he does so by natural means and by the word of God. Let's think about a couple more real quickly, and then we'll finish. Let's look at this one. This is Psalms 106 and verse 15. Psalms 106, verse 15. And the episode here is pertaining to the Israelites in the wilderness, and they're complaining about their food or the lack thereof. And they, they said, you know, God has given us this light bread. So here's how David analyzes all of that episode. It's pretty interesting. He says, I gave them the request, but I sent leanness to the souls. How did God send leanness to the souls? Not by direct activity, but of course, by allowing them to enjoy or at least receive the repercussions of their own fruit. To eat the fruit of their own choices. And that's what God does. So all of this, let's just summarize it this way. The idea is, of course, that God acts indirectly. He acts non-miraculously. He answers prayer. God moves in the world. I believe that God moves in the world. He answers prayer. He upholds all things by the word of his power. But it is a huge mistake for us to suppose because God does something that therefore he touches the chain of events directly, miraculously, and we call it all a miracle. No, instead, I have the great comfort that my prayers are answered by God, but it is how? By natural means. I had a professor at Oklahoma Christian College, you may know of him. His name was Raymond Kelsey, just 
a, a wonderful Christian scholar, a great Greek scholar, and uh, used to preach at uh, many lectureships years ago, just a gentle-spirited man. He would sit in his chair uh, in the class. He was an older man, and he would lecture us about different things, and he would say this. He said, you know what? When you look around and you see what's happening perhaps in your life and you're praying for certain things that occur or do not occur and you kind of wonder, is God answering my prayer? And you think, well, maybe, maybe not getting the answers I want. You ever feel that way? Sometimes I do. I think, well, it's not coming at my timetable. But he said, you know what? As you grow older and you look back over the horizon that you've come from, you recognize, yes, he did answer my prayer. I can see how he was there all the time. And I may not know it now, but I'm going to be able to look back as years roll by and see God was there. And he answered those prayers. Sometimes he answered them no, and that was good for me. But I can see that God's hand was behind it all. That's exactly what Joseph recognized in, jo in Genesis chapter 45. Think about 20 years. A whole 20 years not knowing anything about what God's providence was about and why God had brought him to this place. But finally it dawned on him to his brothers. God sent me here to preserve life. Don't be grieved or angry with yourselves that you sold me here. God sent me here to preserve life. God still moves in the affairs of men. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Our lives are in his hands, Ecclesiastes 9 and 1. Through natural means, through his natural law, God continues to answer prayer. And so I look at this passage in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. We know that if we have the, we know that we pray to him, we have the petitions which we've asked of him. That is to say, if we pray according to his will, we have all the petitions that we ask of him. He might not answer it on our own timetable, but God answers our prayers. He moves in our lives and we're thankful for that. The lesson is yours. Next week, we will continue on thinking about the miraculous in the Old Testament, and we'll move in, into an interesting topic regarding miracles in the New Testament period, specifically the book of Acts. The lesson is yours. If you want to come to the front while we stand and sing, come now.